There was a man named John the Short, and he went to live with a hermit in the desert. This hermit, he became John's spiritual father. And one day, he took a dead stick and he planted it. And he told John to pour a jug of water over the base every day until it bears fruit. Well, the water was so far from John's cell that he had to go off every evening to fetch it, and then he wouldn't get back until the next morning. Well, at the end of three years, the stick turned green and it bore fruit. The hermit, he picked up some of the fruit and he took it to the church. And he said to the brothers in the church, take and eat the fruit of obedience. If you were expecting a joke, there's no joke there. <laughs> it's a good story, though. But imagine someone handing you a dead stick today and asking you to do the same thing. We'd probably think that they're crazy. When a stick's dead, it's dead. And there's no possibility for it to come back to life. Well, at different times in our life, we may be asked to do things that, in our mind, don't, don't make sense. And we may have a better way of doing it. But sometimes if what we're asked to do isn't sinful or against our conscience, then it's the obedience in doing it that's most pleasing to God and what we'll be rewarded for. And obedience is an important word. Our faith is all about being obedient to God. Abram's obedience in our first reading, it was tested. A lot was asked of him to leave his country, his family and friends, everything that was familiar to him, and set off into the unknown, into a, a land that the Lord would show him. And this was a difficult request for him. But Abram, he had faith in God. He was obedient to what he asked. And this call in Abram's life, it was really a call to conversion, to a change of life. God wanted to give him a new name, Abraham, and he wanted to bring him to a new land where he'd make of him a new nation and the father of many nations. Well, Scripture tells us that God wanted to bless Abram, and the requirement for him to receive this blessing was faith and obedience to the will of God. Well, God wants to bless the people of our generation. He wants to bless every one of us. And the path to receive that blessing is obedience. In our gospel, Peter is ready to set up three tents and remain on the mountain. And what's interesting about this story is that he chooses tents. So one interpretation is that the tents are a sign of permanence. Peter and the other disciples, they wanted to stay in that experience of God. But a tent is also symbolic of the presence of God. In the Old Testament, God came to uh, dwell and meet his people at the tent of meeting. When the cloud came down over the tent, it was a sign that God was present there. And eventually, God would come to dwell in the temple in Jerusalem. But today, something else is taking place. The cloud, it comes down from heaven, and from the uh, cloud came the voice of God telling us that Jesus isn't just another Moses or Elijah, but he's God's son. And if this cloud symbolizes the presence of God, then we can say that Jesus is the new tent or the temple. He's the glory of God, the place where God dwells among us. Well, God, he wants each of us to participate in this glory, to become his temples. And he gives us the means to do this when he says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, listen to him. Obedience to Jesus and imitation of him, that'll lead to our eternal glory. But one problem that we all face today is the noise and distraction in the world. It can make it very difficult to hear the voice of God, which brings us to Lent. It's a season that invites us to remove some of those obstacles and distractions that keep us from hearing God's voice. And one good way to do this is to cultivate silence and solitude in our lives. Bishop Alfred Hughes, he wrote a book that I'm reading right now. It's called, titled Spiritual Masters. And in there, he spoke about solitude. He said, if we make time for solitude, our lives will begin moving beyond the noise and messages that ordina ordinarily deafen us and begin to encounter reality as it truly is in God, in ourselves, others, the world, and the demonic. 
And there's a lot of benefits that come with silence and solitude. One, it helps us to hear the voice of our Lord, but it also helps us to become more aware of our disorderly passions. It helps us to uh, be more aware of the temptations and tactics of the devil, um, our human condition, our need for God. But on top of that, it also helps us to become more aware of God's greatness and his goodness and love for us. Now, this theme of silence and solitude, if you're a family person, you have a wife and kids or you have a husband and kids, I don't expect you to ditch the kids and the spouse and go and become a recluse somewhere. That's not good and it's not healthy. And your spouse would probably hate you for it. But we can create a place of solitude and silence in our lives. And one example of doing this would be to uh, wake up early in the morning and use those early morning hours of silence uh, to kind of cultivate that solitude. Um, Bishop Hughes, he also has a few suggestions. He says that uh, we can find a place that gives us a sense of God's presence. He says some will find it in the Eucharistic presence. Others may be encouraged by a view of nature's. Other, it may be a corner in the house where a crucifix or an image of the Lord or a lighted candle or burning incense is supportive of quiet presence. But one thing to keep in mind as we cultivate this silence and solitude in our lives is that at different times, the temptation will come up to give it up. Everything will be going good and then suddenly we're bored or we think that this time is pointless. We're just wasting time. But the truth is, the devil doesn't want us to cultivate silence and solitude. He'd rather us not hear the voice of God. A desert father once said that when the eyes of an ox or a mule are covered, then he goes round and round, turning the mill wheel. But if his eyes are uncovered, he will not go around in the circle of the mill. So too, the devil, if he manages to cover the eyes of a man, he can humiliate him in every sin. But if that man's eyes are not closed, he can easily escape from the devil. And God doesn't want any of us running around blind. He doesn't want us to be humiliated by sin. He has plans for our glory, for us to be saints in heaven. And when we cultivate this silence and solitude, our eyes will be uh, a little bit more open to the tricks and tactics of the devil. And it'll also deepen our responsiveness to that desire for God within us. And so we could think about this Lent and our readings today as God's invitation to us to silence and solitude. We may not want to face ourselves in the silence and we may not want to face the temptations that come up. But St. Paul, he reminds us in our second reading that we're all called to a holy life. We're called to be temples or dwelling places of God. And silence and solitude will help cultivate this. It'll help us become more familiar with God's voice so that we can know the one we're called to be obedient to.